The advancement of AI in the past two years has been nothing short of astounding, and the really amazing part is what the next two years could hold. But there's a catch, and it has to do with creativity, and it might even affect Tesla's full self-driving. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All, and on to the topic du jour, knowledge collapse or mode collapse and neural networks and how the future might be very different. I'm gonna start off with a piece of video from the AI Grid. It's a really good channel. If you haven't checked it out, you should definitely do that. I'll leave a link to the original in the description so you can check it out on your own time. I'm also gonna reference a recent talk between Dave Lee and James Dalma, and I'll leave a link to that in the original. It's a two hour video and there's no real good individual clip. It's just sort of referencing what James talks about throughout the whole thing. So I'm gonna start with this clip from AI Grid it starts about the 18 minute mark in this video. This also brings me to another problem that I was reading about in a research paper, which is the idea of model collapse. So essentially this paper actually does, it's not really talking about work AI and that kind of stuff, but it does talk about something that's pretty similar. Um, and I guess this is kind of, you know, the problem, you know, it's kind of like a similar area. And basically it talks about, you know, model collapse. So essentially the widespread use of AI systems, you know, like LLMs, which we talk about all the time, could lead to a narrowing of human knowledge over time as these models tend to generalize and focus on content which is pretty common and popular information rather than the rare and specialized knowledge which you know we usually sometimes are exposed to which you know furthers discoveries and just you know it's a more broader picture and this knowledge collapse could actually you know harm innovation and lead to a less rich understanding of the world and the diversity of ideas get lost because essentially what we have is AI systems that are you know are cheaper um, a lot of people produce content with AI and because the AI is so centralized in it terms of its belief and always kind of you know generalizes with the same kind of answers we can have uh this kind of problem in the future which is i'm not sure how they're going to solve this problem i think they're going to have to uh you know it's pro probably going to be some synthetic data set and probably some testing on you know trying to understand where the distribution lies in terms of you know the variations where ai is generating content so i think it's going to be interesting to see uh how this goes in the future because these AI systems are going to become more and more widespread and as they become more and more widespread uh these hallucinations and the less diverse the content is in terms of the ideas in terms of the innovation and in terms of you know certain things which are you know in certain industries and certain topics that just really niche pieces of information I think AI systems won't talk about it that much and this is something that I've noticed myself when talking to AI systems like I will know a lot about a topic and sometimes I'll ask an AI just to make sure that it knows and sometimes it won't even bring up a certain point i'm like what about this why didn't you bring up this and it's like oh yeah i do remember that and it's like just because it was on the niche end of the spectrum like it was just on the tail of the tail end of the distribution the ai system sometimes forget to include it so and that's also something that you guys should know as well when you're using ChatGPT. Sometimes it doesn't always give you the entire picture. It just gives you the, you know, centralized distribution of information that it has. All right. So a lot to talk about there. The basic problem we have is that the amount of human language, and we're talking about large language models for just a moment. We'll, we'll get into other things later on. But the amount of information that we have in terms of text tokens, in other words, the amount of language that all humans have ever written that's available on the internet, at least easily... We've, we've exhausted almost all of it at this point. It's some number of trillions of tokens. I think it's like 10 to the 12th tokens. It's, it's a lot. And you can think of that as words. It's more or less words. But anyway, we've exhausted the, the kind of gold mine of that. That's the easy pickings of knowledge. And that's the way that we can emulate human beings. The problem is now you need to continue to scale data. The paper, The Bitter Lesson discusses this, that data is always king. If you can just attach more data to something and scale out the training capabilities of a system, it will always defeat some special specialized, super cool, you know, algorithm that you create or super cool network architecture or whatever it is. So if data is king and we've exhausted all of the language data that's around, how do we generate more data? The obvious way to do that is to use ChatGPT, Claude Opus, you know, Meta's Llama or whatever. It doesn't matter. Use these large language models to generate more words, more tokens of data, and then feed that back into the system and train the next system up to get better and better and better. So the problem with this is that neural networks are universal function approximators. And I'm gonna show you exactly what that means in a visual example in just a second. But universal function means effectively that they can emulate anything, but approximators is the important part here. They don't do it perfectly unless you give them infinite data and infinite compute time. If you do that, then yeah, they'll be perfect. But of course, we're gonna wait around till after the stars die off and you know black holes start to evaporate and stuff like that before we get to perfect representations of highly complex functions. So there is always a trade-off in, in a limited amount of compute and a limited amount of time. You can only approximate these functions as close as you can. 
As you might expect, I stay super busy day in, day out, and this is where Soylent, today's sponsor, can help. I often work 15-hour days, so I barely have time to eat, let alone take the time to prepare meals. Soylent is amazing for someone like me who wants a healthy and nutritious meal that can be consumed without having to plan, prepare, and cook it. Soylent is a science-based meal replacement drink. The formulation is based on research and clinical trials. They've done the homework so that you and I don't have to. But the bottom line for me is that if it doesn't taste good, I I won't drink it. And Soylent tastes great. In a survey of 40,000 people by Cantor Research, it beat out its competitors. Soylent is completely plant-based and has only one gram of sugar per bottle, so it's great for me and my vegetarian and reduced sugar diet. I love vanilla, and my favorite is Soylent's vanilla flavor. It's got a wonderful, rich vanilla flavor I find irresistible. Soylent has a special offer right now for you, my viewers. The first 500 people to use this link and code Dr. No at checkout will get 25% off their first subscription. Thanks again to Soylent for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out my link in the description and use Dr. No at checkout to get your 25% off. And now let's get back to it. So with that in mind, let's take a quick look at an Excel spreadsheet that I generated real quick. I just created a sine wave here. That's what this column is here. I made a sine wave out of just numbers. <laughs> just, just basically went 0, 5, 10, you know, degrees, et cetera, made a sine function and then added random noise to that. And I've graphed it and you can see the solid line is the random noise. So it kind of approximates a sine wave, but then what we can do is we can regress and this is not using neural networks at all. This is just using classic polynomial regression to be able to emulate a sine wave, but what you can see is it's created this beautifully smooth sine wave out of this noisy data. And of course, if you've ever done statistics or applied math or anything, you're probably like, oh, that's beautiful. You know, what a great sine wave it's reproduced out of this noisy data. The problem is if you want to recapture the noise, how do you do it? What this thing is doing, this is an approximation. It's a degree three polynomial approximation of this noisy data, and it produces an absolutely beautiful sine wave. But what it doesn't capture here is all of the little noise noisy stuff. And sometimes you actually want the noisy stuff. The noisy stuff you might think of as the long tail of the distribution. Essentially what we get from these trained neural networks is an approximation that tries to fit the middle of a standard Gaussian bell curve. In other words, this normal distribution here. So generally speaking, you're going to look for a next token or next word in the salmon colored area, which is approximately 68%. You know, it's one plus, plus or minus one standard deviation. So what's happening is that the large language model is looking for the most likely next token and the most likely next token is going to be in this salmon colored area. The issue is that the creativity, the interesting word, the, you know, that the word that pops out that you're not expecting is very likely to be in the blue area or the green area or even way out here. And I guess it's another salmon colored area out here, but you know, it's going to be out there a ways. It's going to be outside the standard distribution. Just like here, we can see that some of the beauty of this function potentially and I just made this with noise. But if we're trying to replicate something in real life, some of the beauty of this function might be this high order noise that's going on here and not the perfect sine wave that's kind of an approximation of this data. And this brings me to a graph of Nyquist theorem, which I always teach when I do sound design because I talk about digitization of sound and everything. Nyquist theorem states that you have to have a sampling rate that's at least twice the highest frequency that you want to reproduce. So here you can see a graphical example. You've got your sampling rate, you know, whatever. If it's a CD, it's every 144,100th of a second or whatever, right? So anyway, it's it's sampling, 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 and it does a good job. It approximates the function very, very well, and you get this sine wave reproduced. But what if you have this really, really fast sine wave here? You can see that what we reproduce is this thing right here, which doesn't look anything like the waveform, the original waveform. So the dashed line here that kind of approximates a sine wave, but not very well, is the best job that something at a sampling rate up here is going to be able to reproduce of a frequency that's this quick. And so if we look back at this graph, we can see that this noise is at a very, very high frequency. It's, it's very rapid, it's happening quickly, and that this sampling rate effectively, the sampling rate of this sine curve is far too low for it to reproduce all of this noisy data, all of this edge stuff, all of the fuzzy things. And if we think of this as next token prediction in real language, all of this noisiness could be those unexpected words that pop up, the things that are out of that normal distribution, the things that are out on the edge, the long tail of stuff.
And if we now reference the conversation between Dave Lee and James Dama, James discusses how Tesla's full self-driving right now has gotten to the point where often when he disengages, he's not the ground truth. He actually made a mistake and the car was actually more correct than he was. And of course you could argue back and forth whether you're correct or not, but the trend is clear that over time, rather than mimicking humans, which is what full self-driving has done since the get-go, right? It's basically said, how far off was I in terms of my decision-making on a second-to-second -second basis versus what a human did because that good human driver is the ground truth and I probably made a mistake. The problem is that that equation is going to get flip-flopped and the human driver is going to more and more frequently make a mistake in terms of the exact nature of driving and the full self-driving is actually going to be better, at which point, even though you've got a ton of human driving data, it becomes less and less valuable to train the system because it's not the ground truth anymore. So even though reality is far more complex and full self-driving has so much more real world data available to it than large language models, you're still going to eventually run into the same problem, which is that you can't mimic humans anymore. You have to do something where you're generating synthetic data and you're utilizing that synthetic data to train the system to become better and better. And of course, going back to the bitter lesson, we know that getting more data and scaling out the training is the only way to make these things better and better and better. But the problem is that once we discard human mimicry, once we actually generate synthetic data, whether that's full self-driving synthetic data out of you know a generative AI that's able to recreate physical world situations that the car has to drive in, or whether it's generating you know fake language, <laughs> chat GPT language, where you ask it a question and it writes stuff, and then it goes like, okay, I'm going to take that amount of time tokens, that amount of words, I'm going to pull it into my training corpus and I'm going to train on that. The issue is that over time as we get rid of the replication of human driving, human writing, human audio, whatever it is, human video, etc. as we get rid of that, we're going to get rid of that lumpiness, that little extra stuff around the edges, which often of course is honestly a mistake. It could be a spelling mistake, it could be a grammar error or whatever, but sometimes those variations are the exact thing that you want to pull out. That's the magic, that's the creativity of driving very creatively under a certain circumstance or writing a poem that's absolutely beautiful and stunning or creating a beautiful piece of music or a video or whatever that is. That sort of human nature, the thing that ultimately we're attracted to because it's like, oh, I didn't expect that, right? The whole beauty of art and writing and I would put driving, you know, creative driving into that category is the beauty of the unexpected. You're balancing out information. You've got things that you expect and you have to have a certain amount of what you expect or else it's complete chaos and you don't understand what's going on. But if it's all exactly what you expect and there's no variation and there's nothing new that pops up, then you have no new information. And no new information is the death of art and it's also really, really boring driving. Now, of course, you could argue that driving should be boring as opposed to language, which would be interesting and music, which should be interesting and videos, which should be interesting, etc. But I would argue even for driving, you need that creativity under some circumstances. Not every day, but once in a while, the car needs to be able to do something pretty radical if it's going to be able to drive effectively in a bizarre situation like a tree falls down in front of you or, or something like that or else there's a flash flood that comes you know wh whatever those weird edge cases are it's going to be able to need to drive in those weird circumstances but the problem is the likelihood is as we generate more and more synthetic data we're always looking for the information that's inside the standard deviation we want something in this salmon colored area here we want that because we want to get something that's likely to happen next. But what we're throwing away is all of this beautiful stuff on the long tail. And that's exactly what the paper, the AI grid that we started with was discussing was that we get knowledge collapse. We lose all of the beautiful stuff out here on the edge. True for driving as well, because we're going to lose human creativity, capacity to drive in a creative way when it's really, really necessary to do so. And just to point out, none of this stuff is going to be particularly important on a day-to-day -day sort of thing. Like if you're writing an email back to somebody, you probably want words in the, in the middle of the distribution. If you're driving on a daily basis under relatively good conditions and all that kind of stuff, you want the car to behave in a very, very kind of mundane, normal way. You don't want anything exciting happening. You know, a boring drive is a good drive. But when you want creative writing or when you 
you want driving that's able to handle really bizarre situations in a creative manner to handle something, that's when you need this outlier stuff and the danger of generating all this synthetic data and then you know kind of feeding it back on itself, right? So it's like you've got reality and then you train these neural networks, they approximate reality, but they lose a little bit of it. Then you generate data, then you feed that data back in. It approximates this new data and that gets even more softer, right? You lose the little edgy stuff and then you do it again and it keeps getting softer and softer and softer and eventually, you know, you just end up with this sine curve here as opposed to this beautiful little lumpy data that you actually have in real life. And that is a significant loss. That means that you've lost access to the most creative aspects of humanity. And I would say that that is an incredible negative and it's a big concern that everyone should have. And even if you say, I could care less about art, I don't think anybody actually feels that, but just for the sake of argument, you know, I don't care about movies, I don't care about music, I don't care about poetry, whatever. If you don't care about that, you still probably care about scientific discoveries and things. And scientific discoveries do not come from the inside of this sine wave, right? They don't come from what everybody thinks. They come from somebody going like, oh, this is a bizarre idea. What if we went this direction and followed this way down the rabbit hole? It comes from these outliers. So you need the outliers, not just for art and not just for creativity in terms of language and driving, etc., but you need it in order to make fundamental discoveries. And so you're going to hamstring these systems from being able to make fundamental discoveries about physics, chemistry, biology, medicine, you name it. You're going to create a situation where these things are good, but they're also kind of lobotomized. They're just going to feed back just very vanilla, very boring stuff, and you're never going to get the really cool word. You're never going to get the cool idea. You're never going to get the creative driving. And then, of course, if you apply that to humanoid robots, you're not going to get the graceful sort of motion where it actually solves a problem in a new and novel way, and it looks beautiful to us. We're going to lose beauty in the world if we just keep feeding the synthetic output of these neural networks back on themselves because as I started with, they're function approximators. With enough time and computation, they can model any arbitrary function, but under any realistic circumstances, they are always approximating that. They're never replicating it perfectly, and that approximation, that inability to replicate the function perfectly, means that we're going to keep losing every iteration we do where we feed the information back on itself. We're going to lose just a little bit of reality, and that is going to be a sad day. So given this concern, how do you solve it? I think the solution is to always keep humans in the loop in terms of creating data, that you have to allow some human data to feed back into the system at all times to just keep it noisy, right? You never want it to become really, really smooth. You don't want that data to become this sine wave. You always wanna keep the imperfections of humanity and reality in scope of training so that these systems can never lose track of what's going on in real life, whether that's language or again, audio or driving or whatever it is. Is, these systems need noise that's injected back in and specifically noise from us humans. So I guess the good news takeaway from all of this is that we humans are still going to be necessary at least to provide some data to the neural networks as they become more and more intelligent. All right, so that's what I've got. Please let me know what you think in the comments. And while you're down there, please do like and subscribe. And finally, a big thanks to Soylent for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out my link in the description to get 25% off and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.